So hi everybody. So it's really glad to be back in ICGV after three years. I think it's not a long time ago that I left, but I think a lot of things happens uh, with me in my professional career, and I'm really happy when I received the invitation to come here and, and share with you what I have done so far. As Marcello said, my idea is not to give you a seminar because I think there is not a recipe how to move from academia to industry, but I can share with all of you what I have been or what I have done in the last three years and and to explain you a little bit uh, where I am now. And also what I want from you is to, to ask the questions. My intention is to answer the question that I had before I moved from academia to industry, but it will be more useful for all of you if, if you raise also your questions and, and as far as I can, I can share with you. And I'm happy to see faces that I know from the past and also to see new faces, um, yeah. So as Marcello mentioned, just to be more familiar, I was part of the virology lab uh, from, I think, 2016 to 2019, where I spent really good time. And uh, I think uh, I, I couldn't be what I am now if I didn't have this opportunity here. So I'm really grateful for the time that I spent here, not only in terms of science, but also meeting nice people. And I think everything complements uh, uh, what you do at the end. So for me, this is an, an important part, and especially keeping the, the relation, I think, is, is, is very good, and I hope to, to keep it. But just going to the topic, um, I will speak how I was feeling when I was uh, thinking to, to go to, to industry. And I do not know if it happened to all of you, but it, this was an idea that came to my mind when I finished my bachelor, so it was not Actually, after the PhD, I, at the beginning of my career, I wanted to do more applied research and going to, to a place where I could, where I feel that I could give uh, or do better. But fortunately, maybe a bachelor is not enough for that time, and I couldn't find a job. So I went to, the, to, to do my master, and I had the same question during my master, and couldn't find something like that. So I, I get to, to get in contact with Marcello to do my PhD. And what I was clear during in my PhD was to, to work in a project that I was passionate in, not, not doing a PhD just because I needed a degree, but something that I could use in, in, in later point of my career. And uh, independently in which project you are working in, I know that many of us, when we are doing PhD, we work in really basic research, but uh, there is always the way to, 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 to make it in a different way that is not basic research. And doing basic research doesn't mean that you are not doing good, good science or you cannot go to industry, it's the opposite. I think uh, in, in industry we really need the expertise that we, you acquire when we are doing basic research. So one thing doesn't disconnect you from, from the other one. So the conclusion from, from this slide is that the, there is not really a big gap. I think uh, what is missing is, is a communication between industry and academia. Uh, when you try to, to find a job, uh, if it's in academia, you find a paper, you know already the PIs that you like and where you see yourself working. But when you want to do the same in industry for some confidential reasons, you even do not find the structure of, of the company. And I, I will say this is the first uh, block road that you, you have to find a job in academia. But uh, there are ways how you could improve it. And I can tell you that uh, networking seems simple and people can really get tired of oh, but how I connect to people. But the only way if you speak to people and you connect. Otherwise, uh, you will not have the opportunity to really get to know uh, what is going on in, in industry. And events like this one, I think, is a great opportunity also to, to bring the two sides to closer and, and, and I start making connection and probably getting a job. So just to make it a little bit more, more interactive, um, uh, I think this is the main question that many of us uh, ask and, uh, and, and there are two options. What I want to do? Do, do, do I want to stay in academia or do I want to, to do a transition in industry? And to do so, I would like to hear from you and I guess everybody has the cell phone. You are allowed to use it for two minutes. And uh, 
if you write just menti.com in your cell phone, you can uh, get access to, uh, and write this number that is here. And I would like to hear from you. Can I participate? Yeah. Everybody is, uh, is allowed to, to participate. <laughs> it's anonymous, so I will not see who, who votes. So just write uh, menti.com in Google, and then you put this code that is in the upper part. Three people, four people already vote, six. We are... We are like 28, so let's wait at least 20 people, 25. Yes, <laughs> okay, so we have already 27 people who already give the opinion, and I think it's really interesting. Are you ready to see the result? Okay, <laughs> that's super cool. Yeah. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so I would say 50 50 percent of, of the audience that, that, that is here today is willing to, to stay in academia, and 50 percent is willing to, to go to, to industry. And uh, as I said before, being in any position doesn't mean, or as Marcello mentioned, that you cannot be. Or if you are not, because I think there is a taboo there that if you go to industry, maybe you are not a good researcher or, or something like that. So you can do great things in, in both places. Just I think the, the, the important point is what do you want to do with your career? And, and it doesn't mean anything. And then I want to move to a second question. I will be the last one because I think it's an important uh, question is when to move from academia to industry, I think. Uh, many of you here are already doing the PSD or, or doing a postdoc, but uh, I think in my case, it's a question that I was always having. And as I said before, even from my bachelor, I was willing to, to move to, to academia very early. But I was always asking, but always the question were around friends that were in the same situation than me and anyone could, could answer this kind of questions. And I think uh, it's a, a, a good thing to start uh, here today. So we have, ah, you got really familiar, already 27. So what do you think, before we see the answers, what do you think is the, 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 the best moment or, or the, how do you see this? After Masters. After Masters, after master, so one thing differently? After this, this yeah. <laughs> so, uh, from our side, maybe after PhD, but the use is I don't know. They would say what, and I think what. Well, okay. let's discover together. What kind, what kind of uh, jobs uh, can be offered after master? And what of the courses? Yeah. yeah. So four people after master, eighteen after PhD, eight after postdoc experience. Do you think that the, the after PhD is the correct one? Well, I will speak about my experience and what I have seen in the company. Uh, all the answers are correct, so there is not one that is more important than the other. I think uh, what uh, is important is what do you want. So in, in the industry, you will have opportunities even without having a bachelor. In, in Germany, there is this option of doing the Ausbildung that just you go to school and then you start the, the formation in a technical expertise and then you can start uh, your career at that point. Um, sometimes uh, um, the, the work itself is not the most important thing for, for an individual, maybe I just want to have a, a work where I can do what I like, but maybe my family or uh, another job is more important than focusing my attention in that specific job. So that can, that can help you to, to understand, okay, maybe I do not need to have a PhD to, to start my career, but maybe you are thinking about making career, or at least this was my, 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 my passion or what I wanted to do when I moved to industry. I wanted to 
not just to, to be a scientist, a person who is working on a specific project, but I want to slowly uh, get more responsibilities. And sometimes I'm questioning if this is what I really want, <laughs> because then when you get more responsibilities, then everything increases and, and, and you start wondering maybe having just a master and, and, and being in the lab doing my work is more healthy than, than being stressed because you get more responsibilities. So if you will, like I did uh, to do so, uh, I would say that having uh, the PSD is the right moment to, to move to industry because there is something in, in, in companies and is that uh, we want to know who is working with us. So when you have the PSD, you already have a really good background. And then it's like a, the starting point is about new. So PSD is just the, the ground floor to start building your career. You can do a postdoc and then come to the company. You have more experience. Maybe you are more confident at this point. But it doesn't mean that uh, uh, the company will trust you more because it starts from the beginning. So you start as a postdoc, you work in a single project. And this is the moment where you show your skills, your competences, and slowly when they get to know you, then you say, OK, maybe you can not work on one project. Maybe you can expand your responsibilities, work on this project, you start to be more independent. Of course, you can also move at the stage of Marcello, Sakina, where you have already a lot of experience. But of course, you will not apply to get the position of, as a postdoc in the industry. You will apply for a different position. So all, all uh, options are possible. It depends always what do you want. and. Um, the important thing is to, to really have the interaction with companies because uh, when they know already you, it's much easier than having a someone that is great by what you do, but we do not know exactly what you do. So somehow you have to prove before uh, the opportunities arise and, and you can really make your career. And this is more or less uh, what I have got. Any questions here so far? So I can speak because I feel already getting wet. But having a title of PhD is something that in the in tick the box at least for your career you don't have to do it afterwards, or you can do a career in industry without a PhD title. You can do, but uh, you have to be stronger in terms it's it's a bit sad because there are people who has a lot of experience working, I don't know, for 10, 12 years in the company, and maybe after 15 years you have the opportunity to be the manager or have your own team and so on. When you have the PSD, uh, the PSD already gives you like a plus. So you, you do it in your two, four years. And then if you demonstrate that you, you are able to, to take responsibilities, then you can move faster. There are cases where people just with a master can, can lead a, a, a team or even have been in much higher positions. But I will, or what I have seen is that it takes long. So you do not but move that fast. I have a question about this. I mean, it's about like PhD. So this is uh, I think it's a degree or someone who is uh, after master, they have worked for five years or six years in the lab, but they don't have the degree because they have worked on the same project. But only the difference is one has a degree, one is just actually to the same. So what about for them? It's a restriction about the degree. Yeah, it depends where do you have the experience because if you have just a master and six years of experience in the company, most no, of the lab, the lab, but in academia. In academia. Without, Without the title. Yeah, yeah. the difference yeah. is that only the experience is the same, working is the same, only the difference is the title of the PhD. I think you start with an entry level. Uh, like uh, it, the experience is really important, but of course, uh, depends on which position you are. Like if you have the master and you maybe are a technician in a lab, there are like 10 different positions between this position. So it's not like you enter with six year experience, will have the same position that a person that just finished the, the master. So in the companies, they really make, or we try to make sure that we develop people working in, in the team even having the same degree, because the degree is just a starting point, then it's up to you to decide how you want to develop. And, and we try to, to, to support uh, the, the development. But um, if you are outside of academia, uh, unless uh, your experience is beyond uh, the lab work, you can 
have opportunities to different job, but if you come with a six year experience in, in, uh, plus a master, only working in, in basic research, uh, it, it can be more difficult that you, you will start in a higher position inside the company. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we have to know who you are before, and, uh, before giving you the opportunity to have a higher position. And with the PSD, it's basically the same. You enter as a, as a postdoc, you are more independent, and you have a, a certain position there, but still you have to demonstrate that uh, not, not just the PSD is gonna make you uh, jump into GRF to be a PhD or something like that. It's, it's a progressive uh, development that you have to, to do, and you are responsible to do so because it can be possible some people say, okay, I want to move to, to, to work in a company because I want to work from eight to five and then have a normal life, maybe have a better salary. But uh, to be honest, at least in my case, I think you work even more than working in academia because uh, you want to, to somehow even to prove yourself that you can do. And to do so, uh, maybe I will speak about this later, it's very complex because it's not only about how good I'm doing science, how good I'm doing PCR or whatever technique you know, is much more or it goes beyond to, to this expertise. If you really want to make a career, you have to start thinking how I communicate to people, how I try to, to work with different people in different things, because the way how we work in the company is not individual at all. From the first day that you arrive, you are introduced to a team, and then you have to work with the team. And it means, for example, in my case, that I start working in downstream processing. I never uh, work with cells. I need to work with people who are responsible for cell culture. And that is amazing because now I do not have to do any more uh, 20 plates of transfections, spending four hours in cell culture, sweating and really tired. Someone does it for you. And if, and if it's a standard process, where you ask someone, okay, could you please take this plasma and put in the cells? That works very well. But we do not do it in, in, in the company. Of course, it depends where you are working, but in, in, in r and department, we do research as we do in, a, in academia. So you really need to, to start uh, thinking about different options, playing around, trying to change condition, temperature, pH, or, or whatever you have to change. But you cannot do it directly. You have to talk to someone to do it. And there it comes the complexity because you are so passionate that you don't care if you work 12 hours, you say, I want to try because maybe it's gonna work. Maybe you are losing your time, but let's try. And in companies, uh, especially people who have many years working there, they say, or oh, at least I was told once, I have 20 years doing this. You are a new person coming here because you have a PSD. You, don't, you cannot tell me what I have to do. Okay. <laughs> and I was a, a German activist, but you are often, uh, exposed to this kind of situation. You say, mm. <laughs> this is not an option. What I do, I, it's like you feel like uh, frustrated because you say, okay, I, I would like to do it by myself. I do not need to ask anyone, but this is not a way to work. So if you are a person who is independent, silent, and uh, do not want to, to have this kind of interactions, you can look for positions that maybe you are a scientist, and, 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 but you do not go to a position where you uh, need to work in a team. And basically in, in a company is, is almost impossible. You really need to interact with people. So how to do that? So then there's when you say, mm, what I did during my PhD or in my formation to learn to talk to people, how? And then you start thinking, mm, I didn't have a training or, or I do not know how to do. And then you start checking online how to find the goal, going through, but making people to do the work for you. And then this is, I think, the biggest challenge that I have to face when I came, because uh, they, this is a specific case, but then you have a big team, because one person is in culture, one person is downstream, one person is a safe development, uh, the manager who is controlling the money, the time that we spend working on that project. And then you have to really convince, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 people to do something. And you say, but why I have to convince people? Because you are not as an individual working as a single project. If you spend three months, six months working in a project, it means time, it means money, and it means delays of other projects. So you really need to, to, to play around and, and get these uh, skills that uh, help you to do what you want and also think if that makes sense. Because sometimes it's like, 
or at least it happened to me, I started working with that project. I was really tough at the beginning. I said, okay, should I be that tough or should I like slow down? But at the end I said, no, I have to do because otherwise this is my project and my reputation will depend on a single project that I have. Six months later or even four, Corona pandemic came. I, ha I was having good results and then I was told, okay, do not work anymore on this project. This is not a priority anymore. You will work now with Corona. I was like, oh my God, so much stress, so much work trying to convince people. And I stopped working after six months in one project. So this is another thing that you have to, to, to deal with, like to don't fall in love with a project, even though it's the most amazing project, because if you don't see a potential business behind the project, then the, the project uh, doesn't continue because uh, what moves uh, companies is the business. We, of course, we do all the research and everything, but if there is not a, a, a goal, clear goal at the end, this project goes in a second priority and then you take another one that probably is more challenging and then you are excited, but could be the opposite. It's like, why am I working on this? But you have to, to learn to, to deal with all these things. So just going through any questions so, until now. Yeah. Um, so you said that PhD for you is the, the base to jump to whatever it is, yes, uh, to, to research. Yes. Uh, would you suggest to students that uh, are doing PhD uh, to work uh, in, on projects that are uh, in collaboration with companies? Or would, would it, would this give a plus for the application or something? It will give you already collaborated in a translational project. It could give you a plus, but what is more valuable is that you are trained, uh, not necessarily working in a translational uh, project. You have to be trained in management skills or organizational skills. Uh, all this, all soft skills that you could develop are equal or even more important than your PSD expertise. So the PSD expertise, independently if you work in basic research, is really, really important, but doesn't mean that uh, selling a project, uh, speaking or knowing how to discuss or how taking action, taking decisions are equally important. And you really see this uh, when you interview a, a person. I have been involved in some uh, hiring processes and you see some people are really amazing, like uh, I published in Nature, I have five publications, 10 publications, I was in the best lab. And they explain to you all the cascade that I describe, all the techniques, and then you start to go broader on the profile and, and people do not know how, what to say, what to speak. So the suggestion is like, okay, yeah, the PSD is important, but doesn't matter if you are working in a, in a specific uh, field, because this is really important. That's why we are hired to work in a company, because you are, you know how to do something, and we need this expertise. But if you want to keep working in, in, in the field or growing in your professional career, you have to expand your knowledge and more than, than doing this, because at some point, oh, this is what I'm doing at the moment. I'm not working anymore in the lab. I need to, to work with people, and I spend more time solving problems that the kid is sick and uh, the project is running who is going to do the, the project because you cannot stick one project to a single person so if someone cannot come to work because of any reason you have to solve it and you have to solve in a way that the person that is taking over the responsibility is happy about this and it's not always the case because someone starts something and wants to finish but you are responsible for this kind of activities and this the only way to 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 do so goes beyond the PSD because you really need to dedicate time to, to, to learn how, and I think there is not a recipe for this. You learn by doing, every person has a different personality. So what you apply with one employee doesn't work for another one. So even the way how you speak, uh, you, you really need to, to find the right words, the right moment, uh, giving people the opportunity to decide because when you are leading a team, it's not basically you who take the decisions, or at least not directly. You have to give the opportunity to, to members of the team to, to decide how to continue. And as a team, we succeed together or we fight together. So it, it, this uh, structure, like I'm the boss and you are the person who works for me, doesn't exist in company, or no one is happy having this structure. So you really need 
to work as a complete team. So now I would like to, to just give you a, an overview of how was the process when I uh, was looking for, for my position. I just tried to put some, something here to, to have a slide to talk about. So um, I was clear that I wanted to, to go to, to a company and uh, I tried to prepare myself for, for this. So I, probably you already know there is a our access prog program running here in Aria de Cerca that I did uh, for six months. And it's something that I really advise all of you if you have the opportunity to follow because it's a program that is dedicated to help you in this transition from, from, from academia to, to a company. And in my case, it was really the time where I have the opportunity to start writing my CV, going to an interview, and having a feedback from a person who is already working in a company can really help you a lot. So the first thing is uh, to apply, look for something that you want to, to, to work. Do not, I know that it can be stressful because I have only two months left uh, to finish my contract and I have to find something where to go. And we start like crazy sending applications everywhere and you submit the, the, the same cover letter and you submit the same CV and the information is there, why to change it? But it's really easy to realize when a person is really, uh, uh, how to say, like uh, dedicate time to, to do the application and it can be just by looking the CV. I mean, the CV is really important because it's, it's the first impression that we have. And when we open a position, we get, I don't know, two, 300 applications. And unfortunately, we do not have the time to go through all the applications. What HR usually does is to use like a filter and they look for keywords and then uh, who put the right keywords uh, is in, in this filter. And then the other people are out. And maybe many of us uh, have been excluded from many positions like this because basically no one looked for, for our profile. And what you have to do is to find out how, how to reach the person. I know that in companies it's not that easy, but I will share what I did. So I went on holidays before going on holidays with Marcella. I said, okay, which is my future here in the lab. Uh, I want to do this, this, and this. Um, what do you propose? We talk, and unfortunately, or luckily, uh, what we discussed was not what I wanted. So I said, okay, he said, well, you have green line, you're gonna stay here as much as you want, but if you find something, just go for it. I went on holidays and I started looking for, for options, and I found a, a, a position that it was like, okay, this I can apply, I can apply, I can apply, and I'm sure that many of you have been exposed to, to these kind of situations. And then I said, okay, I, I really want to take the time to, to apply for this job. Um, I submit my, my, my curriculum and my application. It was like two, three weeks. I didn't get any answer. I was so disappointed as many of you probably have been through the same process. And I said, this is not possible. This position was like kind of written for me. It was like, really, like the, the profile was saying, was missing just my name. At least I, I believe that. <laughs> and then I tried to find the way how to contact with the people, no way. Then I started like, I did a deep research and did I end up finding some guys from Roche who were working with Valproic Acid and Sodium Beauty Ray optimization or gene expression or something like that. And the position was more or less related to that field. I said, I don't know who's this person, but I'm going to write this person. And I couldn't find emails, I couldn't find anything, but I find a LinkedIn profile. That's why I always suggest networking. And I found a person in LinkedIn. I didn't know who was the person, but I wrote an, a really short message, like five lines. Okay, I have applied for this position. I really want to show my interest to, 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 to the position that you are offering in your lab because this, this, and this, and then open to have a discussion with you. Five hours later, I received a message back saying, oh, I really like your profile. Uh, are you available for a talk? And when I talked to this person, he said, I didn't have your CV before. I didn't have to, to see anything from you because I sent it through HR, but the hiring manager, everything goes to the HR department and the HR department does a first screening and then they send to us, let's say a preliminary list of people, candidates that could get the job. In my case, if I was waiting for, for this, I, I think I could have been contacted because my boss never saw it. So by just finding a different way to contact this person and say, okay, look, I, I applied two weeks ago, I haven't received any, any, any feedback. 
um, and I, I got an answer. So for me, it's like this, do not submit an application and forget about this. Because you submit an application and maybe no one even read the, your application. So try to be precise. Always the, the application will be like, okay, we are looking for, a, I don't know, a person in virology, right? And you see and have expertise in virology. Do not be afraid to, to match your CV with what they are looking for. Because at the end, this is the first or one minute maybe that you stop to read the profile. And then, of course, we have to prove if you really have experience in biology. But if you do not write this in your application, how I know that you have the experience? So, do, and also, do not be afraid. Oh, they are looking for a person with uh, I don't know nanoparticles experience because, of course, we have to create a, a profile when we look for specific things. But also, is open for other innovation technology or other profiles so we do not stick so if the fact that you do not match 100 percent with the position doesn't mean that you cannot get it because you can also bring the, the expertise that we are looking for but also an extra and maybe it's not it's, it's not written in the profile but i'm interested if you have experience in something else so do a, an application where you do not send random application to 100 uh, positions spend the time maybe send only five but make sure that when the person read this application uh, will take one minute to read and maybe send you a message to, to talk about it. So that happened to me. I was told, okay, could you, I don't know, at one to have a talk? And I said, okay, this happens only once. I was in South America, six so hours difference. And it was like 4 a.m. in the morning having <laughs> an interview. And I was in for like 9 p.m. And my mother was like, oh, that's so impolite, <laughs> this person <laughs> to, to change it for later. I mom, you, you never know <laughs> if you will have another opportunity. So I couldn't sleep the whole night, of course, uh, waiting for this interview. And at 4 30 in the morning, I was trying to be awake and, and, and have a, a, a first call. And it worked because I had a 30 minutes call with my boss and he invited me later on to go to, to the interview. So first point is your CV, your cover letter, because this is what the, is not gonna be more than 30 minutes, 30 seconds, one minute that the hiring manager will stop to read your profile, but that can lead to a, a second talk and then later on a really formal interview to, to discuss about this. Any question here? Okay. So, well, I already spoke about this. Um, I don't know, maybe Marcello Sakina, you can share more here your experience about the CV. But uh, having this typical CV, black and white, uh, where you put all the conferences that you attend, all the papers that you have and everything is really boring. So if you send an application, I don't know, maybe I'm too colorful, but put colors, change the, the, the design of, of the way how you put uh, your information. Put the information that you consider that is relevant, 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 relevant for, for the position. Do not, it's nice to, to know about you, but I'm really interested if you really fit to, to what I'm looking for. So sometimes you see CVs that are really boring to read. There's so much information, even so many words, you have to be precise. In one, two lines, you can say, I did a postdoc, I worked on this and this. If it calls my attention, I will come to you later on and ask for details. But sometimes I learn from Marcello, less is more. So do not try to put everything because then it can just uh, bother me and I move to the next applicant. So be precise with the information that you put there in a way that uh, is easy to read. So you can do a practice like you have the profile and then you say, okay, is this the information that I want to show according to the, to the job uh, advertisement? Because if it doesn't match, then the probabilities that I'm going to stop to do it are very low. Then it comes the, the interview. This is the moment of, of, I don't know, I think Ursha and many people were along with me because I shared that ah, I was invited to go to an interview. And I think th this is the more exciting moment that we can have when we go to, when we are applying for a job. Because if you already reached that point, you really need to work hard to make it possible. And uh, there are many things that are written everywhere. If you read on the internet, how to be prepared for a meeting, I have to mention one that even I failed, and it's never be late. 
like <laughs> never be like be on time because this is already talking about you how organize and even if it's things can talk about you when i went to my interview i went to germany i went to the hotel and german culture i went in the morning i said ah oh, i want a taxi to go to, to the company and then came the person from the reception and said well actually the the company is very close there is a bus like every 10 minutes you can take the bus and go there and you will be on time and everything is perfect so it makes sense like i can take the taxi i can take the bus i took the bus and then i got down in the wrong entry and i was like 20 minutes looking for the main entrance to go to my interview and i was literally running and sweating on at the time that i had the interview i said okay i really plan how to go there and to be on time the first thing that you have to do and i was late and for me for people who knows me being late is something that i cannot admit and i was to a really important interview and i was late so the conclusion with all these things is like even though you consider that everything is clear and you are planned like it's, it's better to exaggerate to be one hour before that that is better than being late and this is just a, a, a minor point but you can really uh, go through many points that you can see oh that's of course i will not fail on this but sometimes happens so it happened to me and i think to, to many other people and then when you go to to the interview uh, usually the process is quite simple someone is gonna introduce you with the company and slowly they will talk a little bit about the projects what they do but of course there is a lot of confidential stuff that it cannot be shared. So they sell, or we try to show as much information as we can without giving them too much information, because at the end, uh, there are a lot of people that come to an interview and we do not know if you will be the selected person. But then you have the opportunity to present your work. And here I come back to the advice. So you will have like 25, 30 minutes, no more than this. And these are the most valuable minutes that you can have in, in an interview. And in this interview, you have to show, of course, the, the scientific background that you have, because that's why we are hiring you. But do not be too passionate about this work. Do not go to much details. Always has, you have to include these slides where you can give more information if someone asks you about this information. But remove stuff that you consider that is not interesting. If you did, uh, I don't know, work with viruses, good. Uh, your experience that you work with viruses, that you know how to work with the blood, you do fax, you do all the techniques. This is what called the attention because at the end, sometimes we need a person who really have experience in a specific subject and we want a lot of details about this, uh, about your work. But in most of the cases, you end up doing something completely different, but where you apply the same techniques that you used or you learned during your studies. And this is what is really important. Showing how, how, how much experience you have in different projects, how you deal with many things. And this is a point where you have to smile even if you are nervous. You, like personality is something that I think takes like 40% of, of the decision at the end. Like we have been in several, uh, programs and always the question that arises what do you prefer you have like two candidates one has the best uh, cv but doesn't match the personality with the team because when you go to an interview you do not speak only with the hiring managers but you also get to know the team and the team really have a strong voice when we take the decision because uh, they are asked more on, the, on, on that feeling. Do you see this person as a team member? Do you see this person working with you? And then we get the feedback. And in many cases, people really get worried and stressed and put a lot of effort making clear that I'm a good scientist. But I don't care if, if I'm a good team player. And in, and in these uh, trainings, uh, when the question arises, what do you prefer? People say, I prefer a person that of course has the basics of, of the scientific knowledge that we need, but uh, that is a better team player than the one who has the best scientific skills, but doesn't show any, any kind of, of attitudes that could see you working in the team. And that makes sense because and at the beginning, I was like shocked because I said, I'm the one who is putting a lot of effort to, to do my best in, in, in research and I'm looking for someone 
who is independent and work very well. But they said, yeah, that's super cool. You can work for two, six months, maybe two years. But if you are looking for a long-term employee, you do not want a person who just came to work in a project and did the best. We are looking for a person who can team up with the rest of the members of the team. And then if you do not know something, because this nice atmosphere inside the lab, other colleagues can teach you and together we can grow. And then that makes sense because working in, in an industry is not a job that you get for two years. Of course, you get a first contract where you uh, are evaluated, I think, in all the aspects. But the intention is, uh, is to keep this person for a longer period because we are investing a lot on this person. You are receiving a lot of training. You are getting to know all the stuff from the lab. <laughs> I don't want to go to this because it's really, really complex. Like uh, when you work in a normal university, you get an instrument, you start using it tomorrow, seven in the morning in companies. And this is not validated. Uh, you don't follow all the regulations, you can buy an instrument and maybe take one year to start using it. And that happened with everything. Like there are so many, many, many restrictions that you have to train people who are coming to work with you. And it doesn't make sense that it takes one year to train this person to work in a team and then this person is leaving in two years. So this investment that we do at the beginning, because maybe if you are not trained, there is a, another colleague who is training you for six months, cannot be lost. So interaction with other team members has really an important value. Of course, as a postdoc, uh, you don't have this. Um, you are like, welcome, this is the team, this is the project, I start working. And then you say, aha, but yesterday I was a PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> How to do? Find a way. I, I arrived, I remember that I got the, the best new technology for protein purification, the best ACTA, and I was like, but the one that I use, <laughs> I mean, I did the same, but I didn't know anything. And, and then you start like, should I say, should I find by myself? Because it's like the, the first impression that I will have. But you have to do it because as a postdoc, you are considered, and of course you have already a, a, a deeper uh, studies and you, have, uh, you are more independent. Of course, people will guide you for two, three days, but then you are independent. And I think the most difficult thing is that your opinions really have a strong uh, impact. Like, it's not like you are with your colleagues and you say, oh, this is my result, and so on, oh, show me the triplicate, or, or is that really true, or something like that. In, 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 in the companies, at least this is my experience with my department, every time that I show a result, people trust it, and it moves to the next step and taking decisions. And at the beginning, I was shocked because I went home and said, oh, Actually, I'm not really sure if, <laughs> if what I show is true. And you, because you are not used to this, you are used to, to be questioned and you are used to, to be exposed like no one trusts your data. This is the way how. And this is also a problem because I also have this, this personality like, uh huh, tell me, <laughs> tell me more. Do you really did uh, enough studies to do this? And this can be the most arrogant attitude that you can have working in a company because the basis of what we do is trust. If you trust what your colleagues do and, and you perceive the same from your colleagues about your work, the atmosphere is, is amazing. Like you really team up and, and you can do a lot. But if you start from that point, uh, believe me, <laughs> you, you, like you really need, like for example, in my case, like showing a Western blood and like sometimes you say, aha, I did a Western blood, I have positive signal. Do not show this result if you are not really sure, because the, 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 the committee, the team that is working with you, take it as a good result. And then there are decisions that means prolonging the project for two years, investing, I don't know, two millions of euros, like not, not decisions like, okay, I will see in two months what happened. No, there are really decisions. And then you start like, at the beginning, you are afraid, or at least it was my feeling like, oh my God, well, I really need to be careful. But then your boss come to you, next week and say, huh, Eric, how is it going? And if you don't give results, they say, huh, but why you don't give feedback of what you are doing? So you have to really learn um, maybe giving quick answers when you are sure, even though you don't have the, the proper data, but sometimes you have really hide it and, and say, no, wait, because that is also possible. We need to do deeper analysis or whatever is, is the case. But you feel, at least this was my case, you feel a lot of responsibilities and you, for first time, you feel 
that people listen to you and trust 100% or even more. And that is something that, uh, that uh, I was afraid of. Like, uh, and at some point you get used, but at the beginning, is not a normal thing. So if you come to work, for example, in a company, you have to, to consider this kind of thing. When you are a, a side, well, maybe I think I'm skipping things. Maybe before, I, I will just tell you a bit about Roche and then uh, the positions that I had uh, there and, and how is my experience there. So most of you probably know the company, Roche. Uh, I think for me it was like, I read the name and was so excited because it's a very well-known company. And actually I have a terrible experience because when I finished my master, I got to know a person in Venezuela working with this company. And this person, or oh, thanks to this person, and, and now it's told me like, oh, forget about it, your profile is shit. Uh, just, you are not prepared enough to work in a company like this. But I have in my as own way, I like what they do. But when I got to know Pensberg, I said, where is Pensberg? I didn't have an idea. And I was the person who was always saying, I will not go to Germany because culturally it's really different. And for me, it was really important to be surrounded by, by a nice culture of, I don't know, Mediterranean countries, Latin countries, because that is really, really important for me. But I got the opportunity to find the profile that was not written my name, but it was written for me. So I said, let's go there. So Roche is a, is a very huge company, as I mentioned. Is uh, in Germany, the main site is located in Penzberg. There is a second one located in Mannheim, but there are the two places where we do R&D research. Uh, but as you can see here in this map, basically mainly in US, Europe, and in South Africa, in Cape Town, there are the, the main sites where we do R&D stuff. Because there are many places around of just selling stuff or, or just business, but the, the core business or, or the production of all our, our product products are on, on these sites in Germany. And this is a company that uh, started quite some years ago in Germany. Uh, it was, uh, was another company that was taken by, by Roche and is growing, uh, as you can see in the pictures, uh, very fast. It's like uh, at the moment they are building like two new big buildings that the amount or the investment that is being done there is it's crazy and I think there is a space for, for, for many people, like the opportunities that are there are, are huge. So in terms of for you to think about which opportunities or, or how limited are the opportunities, let me tell you that every day there are thousands of open positions and just you have to really go through. And I think it's the case not only at Roche, but all the, the, the pharmaceutical companies have the same because at the end, we also need people with a really fresh mind with the, the, with the innovation. For us, innovation is, is the key of what we do. So innovation is coming from young scientists. If you do not take new people who, who are doing, for example, a PhD or just finishing a postdoc or something like that, so we cannot innovate anymore. Of course, there are PhD programs, but I think we all did the best choice to do a PhD in university because there are many aspects like dealing with the stress, being frustrated about not getting good results. These are things that you only get when you go to a PhD in university. In the company, if something doesn't work, you stop and go to the next project. And if you grow as a scientist in this environment, personally, I do not like because people use, for example, a reagent because it's in a commercial bottle and without knowing what is inside. You have to do, I don't know if you remember that, an SDS without glycerol and then something goes up without going down. And then you understand why the experiment doesn't work. In companies, if you have all the information there, I think you miss a lot of the basic research that is important, at least to fulfill uh, the meaning of what you do, because it's not just about combining things, it's about understanding what, what you do. Of course, everything is more efficient, but when you know the background, because I never prepare a buffer for SDS or Western blood or anything, because we minimize the risk of failing. And the only way to do it is to, it's true, you spend money, but you are sure that there are no mistakes by, by using a own buffer or something like that. But uh, it's good when you have this formation before. So I think we have to suffer a lot to go to that stage. And then you say, okay, I know, but I think, uh, is the, the way to, to do that. So, 
Exactly. I mean, and I just put this as an example because I did an SDS, I prepared a loading buffer and I didn't put glycerol. And I was going around while my samples are going up and not staying and running because I forgot this. And I will never forget this kind of thing, like this, many other cases. But in a combat, you just have a commercial thing. Maybe you are curious because I'm not saying that a person who is doing this in the company doesn't understand what is inside. But in many cases, because you have a lot of work and you are really stressed and you don't have time, just you use and you know that it's going to work. So, so going back to Roche Fensberg is the only place uh, across the whole organization, Roche, where we have the R&D side, but also the production. So all the work that we produce is rampant to production and end up in, in, a, in a product. This is not the case in all the other sites of Roche because usually if something is developed in the US or in Basel, they have to send to another country the production site is, is there. And this is really a cool thing because we really follow the whole process from the development of, of any kind of test to transfer to production. You really need to follow up until the first box of whatever you have produced is in the market. And I think it's really, really amazing to have this opportunity also to to try to see what you do in a small scale in one of the tubes in, in, in these big bioreactor tanks and, and how production sites work. I will go really fast about this. This is basically what we do. Uh, I work in, in antigen and expression technologies department. This is around the size of, of, of ICGB. We're around 150 to 200 employees. And the main work that we do is uh, producing antigens and producing antibodies. Basically, we divide the department in two, in two different things, even though antibodies are proteins as well, but who does antibodies doesn't do proteins and the other way around. And it means that there are a lot of expertise and a lot of people working in the same field, but we go to the minimal details because I think one of the, the comments that I got in the past is like, ah, oh, if you go to a company, you don't do research anymore. And believe me, you do a lot because we, we are not just producing an antigen, we are trying to find the best combination and we really become uh, experts in the field by trying all the possible technologies and everything that can be done. Of course, we do not do a project as a, as a unit, as a person, from, from the beginning, from expressing a protein to, to uh, developing an ELISA, for example, but you work with a team and you get to know all the steps. And when you have this formation, for example, from the PSD, you don't need to do everything by yourself to understand the process. So when you feel that you are part of a team and at the end there is a product, I think for me it's really, really nice and I love to do so. So the main core of our products is Alexis. It's a kind of automated ELISA. I will show you later how, how it works. Personalized healthcare solution, point of care solution, diabetes, tissue diagnosis. There are like different projects where we work, but I would say that the main core is Alexa. Like we really uh, are focused on producing antigens and antibodies to develop for any kind of disease. Uh, and the company has this uh, instrument that is called the COVAS technology. And here, just you have to, what the, our work is summarized in this small boxes is where we put the reagents and then by using this instrument we are able to bring together and, and do diagnosis of, of patients independently of the disease. And what is inside these boxes are basically, as I mentioned, antigen and antibodies. It sounds simple, but there is a lot of work because you really have to develop the technologies where you routinely and biotinely antibodies, size specifically in the best and more optimal way. And that involves, I don't know, 10 PhD students or even more people trying to develop the best options. Sometimes one, one way works very well for one product, but when you have a new one, you have to change everything. And here I wanted to show you, let's see if it works. No, I think it's not going to work. Ah, oh, yeah, this is a small video of how is the principle, the COVAS, or the Lexis assay. And it's just carry over free disposable tips are used to pipette a patient sample into a disposable cup. Incubation with two antibodies begins. The first antibody is labeled with biotin. The second is labeled with ruthenium. Both are highly specific to binding sites on the target antigen. In this example, 
The two antibodies form a sandwich complex with the antigen. Depending on the target analyte, competitive and bridge immunoassay principles can also be applied. Next, microbeads coated with streptavidin are introduced into the solution. Streptavidin forms a strong bond with biotin. The completed immunoassay complex is now ready to be transferred to the measuring cell. The solution is aspirated into the measuring cell. A magnet is applied and the paramagnetic beads bind to the surface of the measuring cell. Pro-cell solution is introduced in order to separate the bound immunoassay complexes from the free remaining particles and to provide TPA, which is essential for the ECL reaction. Voltage triggers the ECL reaction. Ruthenium and TPA are excited in the process. The TPA radical then serves as a reductant, enabling ruthenium to return to its base state with the release of light. The cycle of electrochemiluminescence repeats as long as voltage is applied, resulting in the amplification of the light signal. The emitted light is detected by a photomultiplier. The ECL process is complete. The signal detected is equivalent to the concentration of the target analyte. summary of, of the principle, so I will call it like a LISA, but uh, really going into the details and, and depending on the disease, we work just with an antigen. I was involved a lot working with the production of virus, virus-like particles, and we designed any kind of possible antigen that give us uh, uh, the best class of uh, rare agent to, to increase the signal, to make sure that we do a sensitive, uh, we have a sensitive, but also a specific Test. And this is just a summary, more or less, of, of the updated portfolio that we have at the moment and just involved in the green line that you see that is infectious diseases, but we have uh, tests for any kind of disease. And, and I, I think this is a good point that I will go in the next slide, because when I moved there, I thought I was going to work only in virology projects, but later on, you start really to be involved in any kind of projects. So I started this company, and I'm not German with time, I will try to finish soon. Um, I started working as a postdoctoral scientist, so as I mentioned, I, I, just to give you an overview how it works when you enter to a company, because one first step is getting in, and then how things work inside. So when I started working, I, was, I joined the company for a, for a specific project where I was introduced with the partners that were working in that team, and basically in our case, is one team working on, on upstream process, DSP process, development, and then later on in, in production. So basically, four big teams where we do all the stuff together. You work on this, slowly you start to have more participation in, in, in that project, and you, became, or you become a responsible person for that project. You have, let's say, weekly meetings with your boss, and the rest is up to you. Then there, is, there are no limitations. You can do your work and do something else. You can just stick to your work, or you can do what you want. Like one of the higher managers told me once, like Eric, here you, you do your own path. And you have the tools and the people and the things for everything. It's like sometimes just you need time, and sometimes you say, let's just stop here and let's focus on what I have to do, because otherwise you are slower or you are more stressed and you put so many things, things on the table and you are less efficient than you are before. But this is a, as a postdoc. Mostly you do 100% uh, wet lab work. You, you are directly the person who is, who is working in the lab and is presenting results and discussing and taking actions and everything. Later, I had the opportunity to, to become a scientist. And this was after two years when my, my contract was going to finish. I had to, you have to talk, don't be shy. Uh, talk to your manager and say, okay, my, my contract is finishing. What do we want to do? Because I would like to stay and do my career here, but if not, I need to look around uh, what else is there. And this is not a problem. Managers will, will be open for this kind of discussion. And then I was offered to, to be, become a scientist. That means that you are not responsible only of that single project, because that was the case for me that the initial project was stopped. And then I was working with uh, SARS-CoV-2. I'm really proud to say that this strip test that you see in the market we develop the problems that are used for, for, for producing this. 
And that means a lot of work because then you, you are not only responsible for a project, you are start leading people, being responsible of people, being responsible of some projects and, and taking really strong decisions. At the beginning, you are not used to this, but slowly you get practice, you do a lot of mistakes, but you also learn from mistakes, so you, you have a lot of space to, to improve. And that means that you also uh, reduce the, the real working hours in the lab because you are working with a, a team that is helping you also to do it. And that means that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's very challenging. It's like, uh, if you haven't been exposed to this, it's hard because, for example, I always was saying, ah, oh, yeah, I have experience dealing with people, I have to master students, and uh, like, I, I, I have like two, three years of experience. But this is completely different when you guide or supervise a master student who is willing to learn, who needs to write a thesis and the things in a time frame, than leading teams uh, where are technicians that they want to work for nine to five and they don't care about the results. And then you, you start, this is the challenge. And you really have to find a way to motivate, to coach people, to do together the, the work and, and, and succeed in, in what you do. And since uh, uh, July this year, this year, I became a, a team lead of the downstream process uh, development lab. I have a team of five people working with me. And I slowly, as I mentioned, as a scientist, I, I start working with people. And now I'm, I'm directly leading the team that is coming with a lot of responsibilities. I'm really happy about what I'm doing. But as I mentioned before, sometimes you question yourself and say, this is really what I wanted to do. Because there are some people that with a PhD stay as a scientist forever, and they are involved in some projects, maybe working with one or two people, but you are more independent and you do not, you are not directly responsible for, for projects. When you become a team lead, it means that uh, everybody contact, uh, contacts you for any kind of issues and you go on holidays and you come back and you have 200 emails that you have to answer and in which moment that happens and you have to, to, to I think, take a responsibility of what you do and doesn't mean that if you are a scientist you do not take responsibility but that is like in a, in a, in a bigger impact. And uh, then at this point you do not have uh, this uh, support with your manager like you have like a peer that you speak and you take decisions together and the meetings are more about which project, which project is more important than the other. Do we need more capacity? Do we need to hire a new person? Like it goes to really to another level because the team already has the expertise of how to verify a problem. We can discuss the technical issues with the team members, but the, really the, the, the work, at least as a team lead, is, is more on the management uh, side. And for example, at the moment, I'm really in constant training, trying to do as, follow as much programs I can do to, to really improve. And of course, with time, this, this, this falls. But these are very exciting things. So until here is, I think, a general overview of what I've been doing and what I'm doing at the moment. And have to I, I had some slide here to show you what I do, but I think we are over time. So it's, it's downstream process, technology, and, and so on. So yeah, if you have any question, please just, just skip to, to this slide. Um, there are so many job opportunities. Feel free to reach to, to this website where, where I'll post it in case you see something that calls your attention, fits to your profile feel free to, to reach me out if I can help somehow uh, I can do because this is a way to, to, to connect with a position by knowing someone who can refer to you or that, that always help and I know it's open for, for if I can help so, someone. And just to close also, I mentioned to Marcello before, like uh, companies are really open and willing to do collaboration with the universities and academia is not really like like this belief that we are completely two different environments that we do not want to do any connections. Like we are really open to, to develop new technologies and innovate by, by taking people from academia to stay for a period in, 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 the, in the company or, or just developing together like two parts uh, you do here, we do there and, and so on. So 
Uh, it has to be, of course, discussed. There is a lot of confidential agreements that have to be signed before we, we do so. So our interest in general is to have a patent or, or a, at the end a product. Maybe the other side is more um, uh, publishing or, or developing in research in, in the focus that you have. But there is a lot of space for, for collaboration in that kind of way. So thank you very much and please feel free to have anything.